Um, thank you all for joining Darien Library and Barrett Bookstore this evening for an all-star historical panel, uh, fiction panel with Melanie Benjamin, Marie Benedict, and Greer McAllister. Um, I'm Pat Sherry with Darien Library. I work in book groups and adult programming, and I'm here with my colleague this evening, Marianne Patternity, who's our book group coordinator. I know that all of the, these authors are well known, but I'll share a brief bio with you with the high points in alphabetical order. Melanie Benjamin started out pursuing a life in theater after having raised her family. She um, turned her attention to writing and has produced best-selling novels, including The Swans of Fifth Avenue about Truman Capote and his society swans, The Aviator's Wife with Anne Morrow Lindbergh and Alice I Have Been about Alice Liddell, the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland, among others. In the children's blizzard, Melanie has turned her attention to a cataclysmic weather event which occurred on January 12th, 1888 and claimed 235 lives, but affected so many more. Marie Benedict first entered the legal field where she has gained over 10 years experience as a litigator at two of the country's premier law firms. During the course of her law practice, Marie dreamed of a fantasy job, unearthing the hidden historical stories of women, which is what brought her to writing. In addition to the other Einstein about Einstein's wife, the only woman in the room about the actress and scientist, the Hedy Lamar, and Lady Clementine about Clementine Churchill. And now with the mystery of Mrs. Christie, Melanie has turned her attention to Agatha Christie and a very mysterious episode which remained unexplained for almost a hundred years. And our last author, but certainly not least, is Greer McAllister. Wears many hats. She's a poet, a short story writer, a playwright, and a novelist. Her debut novel was Magician's Lie a USA Today bestseller, an Indie Next pick, and a Target Book Club selection. Her, girl, her novels Girl in Disguise and Woman 99 were inspired by pioneering 19th century private detectives Kate Warney and fearless journalist Nellie Bly, respectively. And now Greer's back with the Arctic Fury, the tale of a dozen women joining a, who join a secret 1850s Arctic expedition and, a, and the sensational murder trial that unfolds when some of them don't return. If you still need to grab a copy of the Children's Blizzard, the Mystery of Mrs. Christie or the Arctic Fury, be sure to drop by and pick one up at Barrett Bookstore. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections available to the community. I hope everyone's ready to learn more about our three authors and their latest releases. And I'm now going to pass the mic over to Mary Ann. Ladies, our first question is for all three of you. Um, historical fact fiction straddles the fine line between fiction and nonfiction. How did you manage that balancing act in your book? Can you tell us about a choice you had to make between historical accuracy and the integrity of your narrative? Uh, Melanie, could you lead off? Um, if were we talking just particularly about the, the book we're talking about today, right? Right. Okay. Um, actually, in this case, no, I didn't make any of those choices that I have had to make in previous novels. This is, for the first time, I, time, I chose not to write about a real person um, or a real life. And that is usually a little more challenging to, and it's more a process of figuring out what to leave out rather than moving things and, around. It's more that, it's more like trimming and weeding. Um, in the case of the children's blizzard, I took an actual historical event, the 1888 devastating blizzard known as the children's blizzard that hit the Great Plains um, on January 12th. 
And I invented the characters around it. I did read some of the oral histories of survivors who uh, and those who had witnessed the storm. And there are three characters in my novel who I took some of those stories and weaved them into these fictional characters backstories but um other than that i really uh, there's a there's a mention of joseph pulitzer and there's a character in my novel who um has had a falling out with joseph pulitzer and that is invented uh, i just wanted to use the word the name joseph pulitzer <laughs> to kind of <laughs> to ground it in reality a bit because he is a failed newspaper man um but yeah, so I, in this case, I had a lot more freedom, which is something I wanted after having written six historical novels where I didn't quite have as much freedom to imagine as I did in this one. I hope that helps. Thank you. Marie, can you tell us uh, about your approach to this? Wow, well, um, I mean, I think in some ways the research, um, my process is pretty similar across all books. You know, I'm really looking for original source material. I write about um, almost always about real historical women um, who've really left us with um, really robust legacies, but we don't know who they are. We don't know that that legacy is attributable to them. So first I'm kind of looking for original source material in the woman's voice. And once I've kind of gone down that rabbit hole, I'm looking to build almost like a, um, an architectural structure of research around that you know, looking at the micro and macro elements of their world and timelines. Um, and in some ways that, that wasn't any different in this case. You know, I built out timelines around the real life disappearance of Agatha Christie. She went missing on December 3rd in 1926. Um, the largest manhunt in England's history was launched to try and find her. Um, it was very sus suspicious circumstances. It almost looked like it was torn from one of the pages of her novels. Um, and then just as mysteriously as she disappeared, she reappeared on the 11th day. So I had a lot, and it was one of the biggest media events of its time. So I had lots and lots of, um, you know, real time accounts of the disappearance. Um, and that really helped me build the 11 days. The story is told in two parts. One is Ag really Agatha's origin story interspersed with um, her husband's account of her 11 days um, of being missing. That sort of fed into the husband's um, 11 days real-time account of um, her disappearance. But in terms of like her story, I had a lot of wonderful material to work with, especially drawing on her autobiography, which was phenomenal. But right at the heart of the autobiography, there was absolutely no mention of the disappearance. And in fact, Agatha never, ever spoke about the disappearance. Um, there was never any resolution about why she disappeared, how she disappeared, the reason behind her disappearance. Um, the authorities never achieved a resolution. So I had almost like this empty blank canvas with which I could kind of invent the story around it. Um, so in many ways, um, I departed even more than I normally do because I create a fictional resolution to this, the, really the greatest mystery at the core of her life. Um, but it is very much built on um, this architecture of fact um, and the kind of logical extrapolations that I drew about her character from that research and from those facts. Um, so it was a little bit of a different experience in that because I did make these this rather wild leap, which I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> Career, how did you manage this balancing act? Well, like Melanie alluded to at the beginning, there's sort of a decision when you're conceiving of the book and when you're deciding to write it. Are you going to write a piece of biographical historical fiction where you're following somebody's life as it was or as it's been captured in the historical record? Or are you using history as a jumping off point? And my last couple of books have, have used history more as a jumping off point to tell a what if story. So the Arctic Fury is set in the 1850s. It's inspired by a real life event, which was the, um, the loss of the Franklin expedition, which was over a hundred men on two ships that sailed um, looking for the Northwest Passage in the 1840s and, and never came back. Um, and actually those ships were so deeply and, and profoundly lost that they did not find them until 2014 and 2016. 
Um, so it will be no surprise when I tell you that all of the expeditions that were sent to search for the Lost Franklin Party did not find them. Um, <laughs> But it was just uh, wave after wave of expedition being sent uh, into this this wild no man's land as far as the as far as the British were concerned. Um, and I got a, a, a bit of a spark about, well, what if there had been an all female expedition that went? And Lady Jane Franklin, who was the the wife of the expedition's leader, John Franklin, really did play a very important role in motivating and even funding the expeditions that went to search for him. And she was a woman ahead of her time. She was doing things like sailing up the Nile and meeting Bedouins and um, climbing mountains in Tasmania and doing all sorts of things that you would not think of a woman of the 1840s as doing. Um, and the more I got into the research, the more I found these sort of extraordinary women of the 1840s and 1850s who were living on the fringes of society and doing things that you would not think of as society women's activities. So there were battlefield nurses and journalists and um, early feminist writers and um, all sorts of really, really interesting people, mountaineers and and really interesting people. So I sort of assembled an all-female supergroup uh, to go and, and do this Arctic expedition. So I based some of the women in that party on real women of the time, but in almost none of those cases does the woman have the name of a person from history. In, in one case it does, and then it's sort of a composite character. So uh, an author's note covers many sins. Um, and so I always feel that it, seeing the nods here too, I feel like if I am going to depart from history, I need to explain it. Um, because otherwise I get emails um, with people telling me I did it wrong. And I get emails with people telling me I did it wrong anyway, <laughs> but I get fewer yeah. of them when I explain, um, listen, I know that this didn't happen, but uh, here's why. Uh, because history doesn't uh, always supply a, fa a, a satisfactory narrative. Um, and above all else, I want my readers to enjoy the read and love it and get lost in it. And so I will change uh, the historical record when necessary to do that. But in a lot of times, I'm, I'm far enough from reality with that jumping off point or um, there is no historical record in, in a lot of these cases. I wrote about Kate Warren who's the first uh, female Pinkerton detective and there's almost nothing written down about her. And so uh, I regard the, the gaps in the historical record as kind of an invitation. And that's what historical fiction is really good for is telling those stories that weren't written down or were lost along the way. Exactly. I love that phrase, invitation. It's always in those dark little cracks and shadows that I feel like it's like a, an embossed invitation. To us. I always, I always talk about. I look for the 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 locked doors and dark corners behind the known history is what I, like I have always sought out in my writing. I love. love it. Very interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ladies, you've um, shared some of your inspiration for, for each of these books with us. Was it personal for any of you, this particular book, this particular choice? Melanie, would you like to begin? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, some, this is my seventh historical novel published in the last 11 years. And uh, evidently, I had a pattern that I hadn't seen <laughs> that people told me that I did. Certainly, I knew I was writing mostly about women whose stories have either been forgotten to history or told by the men in their lives. And that's what my previous books have been about. But other people saw them as more as having a glamorous or sophisticated kind of um, sheen to them, which is not something I had ever was really conscious of doing. And so I've had people say, well, this is such a grittier book for you because it is set on the prairie it's been called Stephen King meets little house on the prairie for uh, because the first half of the book is it has a very very much a thriller aspect to mm -hmm. it as these various characters are trying to survive in this horrible storm and um it's personal to me because I have long wanted to write something more with a Western kind of a, uh, you know a, a Western bent to it and this never really found the right story 
And this one spoke to me because my own family, my mother's family were German, um, came, were German immigrants who came over roughly around the same time oh. as the characters in the children's blizzard um, who are Norwegian immigrants. It is an immigrant story too, in, in many ways. And my, my mother's family settled in Illinois, not the Great Plains, but still they were farmers. They are farmers to this day. Uh, one of the things I wanted to explore was how the parents' decisions to leave everything they had known and get on a ship and come over to the United States and spend their, you know, try to farm um, unfarmable land at the time, a punishing land, tied their children and their children's children and their children's children generations to the land without many choices in their lives. And so that, I know that, I know these people because they're in my family. And even though my particular side of the family went to the big city of Indianapolis and <laughs> left the farm, um, I still, at family reunions and through stories, I still know these people. And so it was very personal to me in that way. Marie? I, I just have to say, I love that, Melanie. That just, uh, that's such an interesting insight into the book. It reminds me, I, this book I wrote, Carnegie's Maid, which is really about an Irish immigrant turned domestic. It's, uh, that's the only fictional character I've written. And again, it's like, it's my family's history. They were all Irish immigrant domestics, you know? And you feel like through that passed down storytelling, that oral history, you really know them. That's that's yeah. incredible. I can't wait to see it. Um, I think for me, um, well, Agatha Christie's kind of always inhabited me. That's kind of a weird way to describe a writer, but or an author. But you know, I grew up. I had this wonderful aunt growing up who um, was really responsible for me turning into a writer. She was an English poet, an English professor, and a poet, and a rebellious nun. And she like was really the one who like gave me books. And um, in addition to this one book that truly set me on the path that I'm on now she like fed me a steady diet of Agatha Christie. So I, I always loved Agatha Christie, the worlds that she created, this, the satisfying resolution of this disordered world. The, um, I loved um, the, un the puzzles at the center. I just loved it all. So I keep this like running list of historical women that I, I, I really would love to learn more about, or I feel like deserve to, to be told, their stories deserve to be told. Um, and Agatha was always on it, even though usually I write about women who are unknown. Um, and when I kind of did the research into her, because I really didn't know that much about her upbringing, sort of what she was like as a younger woman. She's kind of frozen in time in my mind on, on those back, those jacket flaps, you know, with the coiffed silver hair and the tweeds. And you can imagine her sipping her tea, writing her books. Um, but that it really is just one part of who she was. That's who she became after the disappearance. That is not who she was before the disappearance. She was a very um, adventuresome woman with tons of joie de vivre and gregarious and, and that changed. Um, but like all the women I write about, she's really dealing with very, I think, modern issues. Um, she's dealing with issues around um, being caught in the crosshairs between the, the societal message she's receiving at the time that women need to take care of their families. They need to put their husbands first above all else. A good marriage in your home is more important than anything. Um, and that ambition is a dirty word. Um, so she's really struggling, you know, in the days leading up to her disappearance, this is one of the, the major um, issues in her life. And I feel like in many ways, that's still a very modern issue. I think a lot of us working moms in the pandemic are finding that to be her, <laughs> we're caught in the crosshairs. Um, so I really, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for that legacy, but I'm always looking for issues that really speak to me. And I think that the, the issues that she was dealing with really spoke to me. Um, and then, of course, I have this like warm and fuzzy feeling about Agatha Christie. And she was so incredible. She really was. Her her origin story from like this idyllic E.M. Forrester-esque existence on the Devon coast in England to, um, to her disappearance is quite a ride. So anyway, that's that's for me, I think, probably the closest real connection I have to her story. Very interesting. Greer? I think my story is it's pretty wide ranging. And I think that, you know, as writers, we're always getting, whether we're looking for it or not, we're always getting advice about writing. 
Um, <laughs> and I think some of it's trash and you should completely ignore it. But one piece of writing advice that I like is write a book that only you could write. And I feel like you could give any number of writers the prompt of, you know, write about an all-female expedition to the Arctic. And as many writers as you gave it to, you would get that many extremely different books. Um, and I feel like taking this story and making it historical, making it inclusive, making it this sort of wide ranging 13 perspective uh, craziness um, is something that, that it challenged me as a writer for sure, um, the research and the writing of it. Um, but I think it is something that, that was very true to my spirit to collect these women and explore these women and explore what it meant to be a woman in that time um, in a way that, that I wouldn't have personal experience with. So it's not a connection of me, but it's, it's me exploring. But to your point, I mean, we all find that personal connection with the story we want to tell. I have, I looked at some of the stories that Marie has told it through her books in the past, because, uh, you know, with my first book was, was uh, 2010. And along the way, I'm talking years and years ago, I had looked at Agatha uh, the Christie, I had looked no at way. Mrs. Einstein, um, Hedy Lamar. Oh I didn't gosh. feel the connection with them. I did not feel I could do those books. And okay. so even when you're not writing about your own family, there still has to be something you, yeah. even if it's Truman Capote, who I related to <laughs> surprisingly and horrifically well to, <laughs> really scary how easily I got inside his skin. Um, you do, I think when we decide to write a book and go down that path, we there is a spark. There is a personal connection that maybe we don't, understand that there is something in this character or in this story or in this setting that does speak to us, even if it's not our own personal experience. Absolutely. I mean, you said that so well in terms of it, you sometimes don't actually know what it is. You know, you're doing the research and you could be looking at, and it's so funny, you looked at some of the same people I looked at, like, yeah. you know, you look at them and you think, I, mm, no, like if Greer, if I had been faced with the list of you know, 13 lady expedition, you know, I would have, that would have been just way too daunting. I, I don't know. I couldn't have done that. Um, but there's, there has to be something in there that's very unique and personal too. And sometimes it's, it's hard to say what it is like with Maleva Marish Einstein, the first in the series. I mean, I, I wanted to run screaming from the science in that book, but yet there was something about her as a person and her, the sort of juncture she was in her life. So it's, it's very intangible sometimes. And sometimes yeah. you don't know it until you're in it, what it is. I've written two entire books recently <laughs> in, in the past few years that about real people who lived. And I wrote the whole book before I figured it out that no, this wasn't the right person for me. I couldn't make them come to life, you There's know, and, and, uh -huh, and I decided not to publish them because they just weren't, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Like I had felt I had done the other books. I couldn't make them come to life. Mm -hmm. But to your point, sometimes you just don't know, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. oh, this should have been a short story, not a whole novel. Hmm, right. I'll learn. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, ladies, all of your stories take place in a different time. Uh, I'm curious about how did you put yourself into that time? How did you transport yourself every day back to that period? Uh, I mean, do you have something on your desk? Did you, while you were writing this, that would remind you? Or did you listen to music or a special drink? Um, <laughs> was there anything that, that you did? Yeah. And in addition to that, um, once you were there and back in that place, how did you come back to the 21st century? And did any weird things happen between then and now that were either sort of humorous or dangerous or anything like that? We'd love to hear from each of you on that. Can we start with uh, Greer, I think? 
Sure. Um, for me, when I when I'm in the zone and I'm writing, it's not usually so much that I decide to go back to the 21st century, but the 21st century yells at me from the other room uh, in the form of a six year old or an eight year old that needs something, needs food, needs wakes up in the middle of the night, whatever. Um, so it's it's kind of a forcible reentry uh, in most cases. Uh, and I, you know, I do a lot of research to get into the time and I love to know, know what the smells and the, the, the sounds of the period are as well as the, the sights. But the thing that I use to get myself into the writing place is actually totally anachronistic because I'll pick a theme song for each of my books and I will play that theme song because I might have 10 minutes to write. I might have half an hour to write on a blissful, amazing, wonderful day. I might have three hours in a row to write on a weekend or something. Um, and so in, to get myself into the mode, I play the theme song. So the theme song for the Arctic Fury was Steady As She Goes by the Raconteurs, which is not a song from the period. It's from the last 10 years. Um, but hearing it, it's almost a Pavlovian response of being like, oh, it's writing time. Okay, I'm in. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. Um, Marie, did you have any special tricks? I have to say, mine is pretty similar to Greer. I, you know, I think I, once I've built the world, um, th that's the biggest first step of it, right? The details. You like smells and sounds. I'm all about the food. I always want to know what they're eating in the time period, you know? Um, you know, those things like the, that bring it to life in your own mind. And of course, you know, letters, journals, things like that in the, in the woman's own voice are very helpful um, for me to kind of get behind her eyes to see the world as she does. But it, it is really the music. It, and it's weird because it, I don't pick period things. It's, I don't even know how I pick what I pick. Um, but I play that on a loop for a really long time until after, once I'm done with that book, I cannot listen to that music again. It is like, you know, a hammer to the head. But, you know, like, I think, what did I just write? Oh, um, uh, a book about Rosalind Franklin is um, my, uh, I have a, a book coming out in June, but this is a book for next January. And I listened to Glenn Gould, the pianist, um, mm -hmm. play classical music. Oh yeah, personal mm -hmm. Um And um, it, because it, it feels like very um, mathematical and scientific and organized and it's writing. And I, I don't know why that was it, but other times it's been like, you know, more, much more modern music. I can't say what it is about a particular, but, but definitely that listening to that is like, you're right. Oh, it's, it's time to write it. It's right again. And um, there's been scientific studies on why that works, but all I know is that it does. It does. It does the trick. Exactly. Melanie, do, what, what are your tricks? I don't know. I just, I don't know. I don't have all these tricks and talismans and things. I really don't. I, just sit down and write. <laughs> and then, I, then when I'm done for the day, I get up and I live my life. I, I can't say I'm fully engaged in the world when I'm writing. I do think that there's always a part of me that even when I'm not consciously sitting down writing, there's something going on in my head that, that uh, you know, that, that just is happening. I'm sure my husband could tell you I'm not completely fully engaged in the world sometimes when I'm writing, but I'm certainly not going around churning butter like, <laughs> like my character were. <laughs> or in the case of the two protagonists were young school teachers in this case, I wasn't carrying books around and writing on chalkboards. So, so, and I don't do the music thing, I really don't. Um, so I find, so I, I mean, I can see how it would be helpful, but I've never really had a hard time just entering into the world I need to do. And of course you do the world building before you start, at least I do the world building before I start writing, which is the research, which I, I reread a lot of Willa Cather in this, in this case, most of Willa Cather. Um, I do usually find an image either of the person I'm writing about or in the case of the children's blizzard, of course, there were no photographs in those times, but there was a newspaper illustration after the storm mm -hmm. that tried to depict a, a, a look like a, a school teacher and her charges huddled out in the snow, you know, the very Victorian kind of newspaper style. And I did find that. And I usually make that my, my wallpaper on my computer. Uh -huh. But that is probably the only thing I really do. But like I said, I do the world building before. So in my mind's eye, I see where I am. 
I, 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 I feel where I am. I, I know what the clothes feel like. I know um, I'm not so much about food, um, but smells for sure. And more for me, it's just more about what the person sees. I have done that research. And so it's, it's all there. And I've learned to not write too soon that I live with this stuff in my head for quite a while before I actually sit down to write. Um, but like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm walking around in the 19th century the rest of the day, although I will fully admit I am not completely engaged in um, the world. Uh, that's why I think I took this year off. I didn't write a book this year and it had been planned even before a pandemic and, um, you know, the most uh, contentious election in history. I don't know how anyone could write a book this year because I think it would be really, really hard not to be so engaged with the news and the reality we're living in now, I that I don't know how anyone did it. If you did it, Marie, that's great. I could not have done it in the last year. I do think it works best for me if the world, if I can tune the world out a bit, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. yeah. Very difficult to do this year, that's for certain. <laughs> it was my escapism, honestly. <laughs> it was going somewhere, you know, during the hours that my kids were doing their virtual school where I, I you know, could go somewhere different and just be in a different world with different characters <laughs> and just away from it all. Really, that's what it was for me. A better place yeah. in, in some ways. Oh yeah, yeah, and definitely different. <laughs> definitely different. <laughs> Melanie and Greer, here's a question for both of you. In each of your books, people are facing moral dilemmas brought about in part by mother nature. And these are extreme situations that each of your protagonists faces. Was this what you wanted to explore the effect of extreme pressure and the choices we make at that time? Um, Who do you want to go first? Uh, Melanie, do you want to? Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, uh, like I said, this is a bit of a pivot for me where I'm not telling, you know, a real person's story. I wanted to tell a lot of people's stories and I wanted it to be, I really loved the idea of this, this horrible uh, nap, you know, weather tragedy. I loved the idea of personal dramas and stories and just trying to survive playing out against this much bigger, much more terrifying backdrop. That juxtaposition of the bigger event and the little people trying to survive in it and many different perspectives, because I do have six different protagonists that we follow through this. That was what I wanted to do because I felt I needed to stretch myself as a writer. I, I really was not inspired at this point to continue going down the path I was going down. I wanted a bigger palette. I wanted to use all the colors. And I really loved the challenge of writing about nature in, in this particular situation, this, this ferocious blizzard that was a writing exercise. You know, how many words can you use to describe snow and cold and wind? That is a, a wonderful writing exercise that I really wanted to, to rise to that challenge. I also came to see it as exploring ordinary people suddenly faced with extraordinary circumstances. And that decision you make in a terrifying moment, and in this case, it, we, we do follow two sisters who are school teachers young girls only 16 and 17, which was typical of that time, suddenly having to make a life and death decision in an instant when the storm hits. Do they keep their pupils inside the school and risk freezing to death or do they send them home and hope that they will outrace the storm? And so we have two just young women who suddenly have to make this decision that turns out to have an enormous impact on their lives and survival as well as those of the pupils in their charge. That was really interesting to me to me to explore. And I thought it was no, you know, to, to do that in the face of this ferocious weather. Um, it was very, very appealing to me. Uh, it is what I wanted to do. And again, the, 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 the blizzard takes up the first half of the book. The aftermath is the second, the impact of these decisions that these people have made and how they play out. But the first half of the book is truly this kind of thriller story, I would say almost a Jack London-ish kind of story of survival against the elements. Only instead of men with sled dogs, they were young girls and their younger children in their charge. 
So um, yeah, I just, I loved that. It was really what I wanted to do. And uh, it's the reason why I chose this particular story. I felt it really pushed me and challenged me as a writer. I, I used, um, you will feel all the feels. If there's a tragedy, of course, there's a tragedy, but there's also hope and resilience and survival and love. And I just really, really wanted to explore it all. And it seemed to me nature was the best way to do that. And you did it beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> Greer? And for me too, it was that setting. It's this idea of the Arctic, which mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a great big mystery to most people um, for very good reasons. And it is you know, as, as you look at it, an environment that is actively trying to kill you at all times, um, like nine months out of the year. So for people to willingly go into this is crazy. Um, but it is that sort of like Melanie was talking about the crucible of, I have these 13 different women from very different walks of life, different, um, backgrounds, different classes, different ethnic, uh, backgrounds and they're all thrown together and the great thing about that is that you don't have to worry about society you don't have to worry about whether your ankles are showing um but you are completely dependent on each other for survival for survival you cannot be um independent and you know distant in that kind of in that kind of crucible so i really wanted to explore that and bring together all of these different women in this um in this environment. So having that, having that um, setting was just powerful for me. Um, and it goes, it goes back and forth in time, sort of like Melanie was talking about hers is, is partly the storm and partly the storm's aftermath. Mine is um, partly the expedition and partly the murder trial that takes place a year after the expedition. And I really also wanted to set up this idea. I mean, the first line of the book is uh, in the front row sit the survivors and you know right away, not everybody's gonna make it back. So I loved playing with the timeline so that there are dribs and drabs of information coming along the way, um, who's gonna make it and who isn't uh, as they're and going. Is, is this the first book any of you that you grew, this is the first book I've ever written where nature is such a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, where sure. weather impacts it, where nature, where the elements are as big a story as a bigger character as the actual people in it. Cute. Is this the same with you, Greer? I mean, and again, I love the challenge of that. It is really cer certainly why I sought out this story. How about you? Has, I, yeah, you for sure. And I had to spend a lot more time looking at like temperature tables and, and uh, Google Maps and things like that, because the difference between May and August in these places that I'm talking about is a huge, huge difference in terms of the passability of the bay, in terms of the passability of the um, land. Like there are places in the land that you can't travel unless it's frozen and you can't travel in the bay if it's frozen. Um, so I had a lot of, I had to look at a lot of um, <laughs> tables um, to make sure that, that Science. Yeah, it's always on the edge of plausibility, but to make sure that it was at least somewhat plausible that they would take the route that I laid out for them. Um, this is my first book with a map. None of my other books have ever needed. You know, and I, mine has a map in it too. My, I'm not good at geography, but my um, brilliant editor suggested, even though these are in fictional places, the homesteads are fictional, the towns that they're around or the communities around are real. So we actually... I had to, to plot out a map, like using like a ruler and, and scale and trying to, in my, you know, these places that I sketch out in my head, suddenly I had to like decide how many miles apart they were. And then a cartographer did it, you know, with, did the map with my input. And it's like, that was real. I don't, that was, that was a challenge for me because I'm not that spatially um, gifted. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds almost as if the the setting, whether it was weather or the Arctic itself, was like another character in your book that you had to get a handle on and see how it was going to interact and interface with your cast of characters. I still don't know how you guys wrote the weather with six to 13, however many <laughs> characters. I can't believe it either. Yeah. Oh, it was so fun. It was so Look, fun. This is such a tragic that. book, but I had so much fun because of that, because six different people are experiencing the storm in a different way, right. each one of them in a different location in a different time and with their own different personal issues and yeah. struggles. And I just, again, I found it a really challenging writing exercise that I really needed to do at this time in my life. 
That's uh, that's so interesting to hear. I I, I I don't know. I'm so interested in other writers' journeys, just like I'm interested in writing about the women that I write about. Or Agatha was a writer and her journey and how yeah. she got from point A to point B. So that's fascinating for me to hear from both of you. We well, are bringing up our next question, Marie, which is directed to you. Oh, no. uh, you have written about Einstein's wife. You wrote Clementine uh, Churchill about Hedy Lamarr, mm -hmm. among others. Um, would you say women have been neglected in historical fiction or reimagined or dignified by the genre? Um, I think women have been neglected by history in general. I think um, women have been, um, whether they've been so vastly underestimated that their presence didn't seem to be warranted in the pages of history, or whether they are purposefully marginalized, which is sometimes the case with the women that I write about. Um, I think history has done women a disservice, um, whether it's how we depict them, whether their stories are recorded, maintained, whether their records, their letters. I mean, sometimes I'm sure Melanie and Greer know, you go back to find somebody who was a real life person and the record around them is so paltry. Whereas a, a man who was similarly situated, there, there would be a wealth of, of information. Um, and so I think it's really history that has done such a disservice to women. I mean, we're all women sitting here. We know what we're capable of and all that we've contributed and the vastness of our own legacies. Why would we think that just because someone lived a hundred years ago that they didn't do, you know, monumental things? So I feel like um, what his, what I'm seeing a lot of historical fiction do now, which I love, is resurrecting these women, giving them a second chance at life, putting them back into the narrative where they where they've been the whole time, but nobody wanted to to write their names and record their deeds. And it's, it's really the historical fiction that's going back and giving these women a place in the record, in the narrative that they've deserved all along. Um, and I think more and more and more it's happening. I think 10 years ago, um, when I probably first started, you know, thinking about some of this, there, it was, it was out there, but it, not like it is now. And I think it's exciting to see so many authors exploring, um, the power of women and the legacy of women, real or imagined, you know, sometimes we have to imagine these women because there's no way the real women are recorded. Like for just, for example, Carnegie's Maid, which was about a fictional woman. I mean, I, she was, I know someone like her existed in the historical record, but there's, there's no, there's no, letters, documents, nothing about her. And so she, you really have to amalgamate several women so they become representative of the sort of women who made those contributions um so sometimes you have to fictionalize them or sometimes that you know like in the case of Greer and Melanie's books these women have done incredible things you know they're out there you know that you know that they've been out there doing these things all along um and you need to tell their tales whether or not you know their names um so I don't feel like it's um I don't feel like it's historical fiction that's neglected women. I think it's history that's neglected women. Yeah, but very good point Maybe right there. <laughs> Greer, can you speak about the importance of writing inclusively? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that topic. Sure. Well, I think a lot of it follows very naturally on what Marie was just saying, which is, you know, I had, I know I'm not supposed to read my Goodreads reviews, but I was reading my Goodreads <laughs> reviews. You're yeah. braver yeah. than yeah. I am, Greer. Um, I should know better, but I always, but I always I do. do. Um, and I'm getting to the point in my career where I can sort of laugh at and shrug off the ones that I don't like and, and internalize the ones that I do like. So it works out great. Um, but you know, there's somebody who's mad that there are people in my book who are LGBTQ uh, uh, and seem to think that gay people were recently invented, which is not the case. So <laughs> they think it's anachronistic for me to have uh, for me to have people like that in my book. And I just the idea that 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 is a mindset that's out there um, means that I've got to work harder. I think so. Um, the reason that I'm writing inclusively, the reason that I'm making sure that, that Arctic Fury represents people of lots of different backgrounds is because 
we were all there all along. Everybody was there all along, but their stories weren't written down. So like Marie said that women have been left out of history. People of color have been left, left out of history. If you, you know, you grew up on a diet of Wyatt Earp and OK Corral sort of Western. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I read an article the other day that some, some um, extremely high number of cowboys were black because they were sort of fleeing from the from the South and going out to where the frontier is, you're always gonna find people on the frontier um, who have less to lose. So mm -hmm. there, were, there were always people um, in every part of society really um, that were left out of fiction. So when we write inclusively and try to make sure that people of all kinds were represented, we're not forcing that diversity into, um, into the fiction. We're just trying to reflect things that, that should have been reflected um, before. So that that to me is the importance of writing inclusively when I write. And, and I fiction. and I felt very strongly that our version of the prairie and the homesteading years is very you know influenced by Little House on the Prairie and the books and the TV series and or and even in the history books the whole manifest destiny thing tends to be a, just a white native born American story and that wasn't the truth. <laughs> um, there were a lot of immigrants out there and you really don't see that in those stories and there were black homesteaders which I talk about in my novel. Um, the prairie wasn't just white and also all this came obviously the, the tragic cost of uh, the Native Americans losing their you know having their land taken away from them and being forced um, basically in genocide and incarceration and these are stories that we don't always hear in history or in the fiction in this case that is probably has made this period the most well known and widely read. So I did feel it was my duty as a writer today in 2021 to include those stories as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of look, call it, you know, uh, more realistic Little House on the Prairie or Little House on the Prairie for adults in 2021. But it's not it's not me doing it and uh, uh, inventing a falsehood right. or a false portrayal. It is the real portrayal that just has not been portrayed. And, and I'm trying to change that. I love that. Well done, ladies. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes. Uh, Melanie, uh, you uh, spoke a little bit earlier about the oral history, the research that you did. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Did you travel? out to that part of the world at all? You know, sometimes I do travel for the locations of my novels. I, you know, went to Paris <laughs> for Mistress of the Ritz and State of the Ritz. So that was really of fun. Uh, <laughs> um, I was pretty familiar with Nebraska already because I, I had, I lived in Chicago for over 25 years. And um, in the recent years, my younger son had moved to Denver and to drive from Chicago to, De De to Denver you drive through all of Nebraska. And so I knew, I knew the landscape. Um, so I really didn't like make a pilgrimage to Nebraska. And one thing I'm sure you all know is when we go to visit a location that we are writing about in a time period, several, maybe 100, 130 years past, we have to mentally erase things that are there now. So the landscape of Nebraska even now is not what it looked like to these homesteaders because any of the trees that we see there were planted by these homesteaders. They weren't there when they came. So, uh, but I did, you know, I certainly knew Nebraska. There was an excellent nonfiction book called The Children's Blizzard by David Laskin that came out about 15 years ago that was very, very helpful to me. Um, and he goes into a lot more depth about the science of how weather forecasting was done in those days and how the the army signal corps was the branch of the government that was in charge of indicating the weather as they called it and how that happened and there is some of that in my novel but he goes down way more rabbit holes than i do but but the book was very helpful and he also drew on this collection of oral histories called in all its fury the great blizzard of 1888 and uh, what happened was in the years after the blizzard, um, and this was just a ferocious blizzard, even by the, you know, these people knew bad weather on the, on the plains in those years. I mean, the weathers were awful. Uh, the Little House on the Prairie book, uh, The Long Winter, was written about the winter of 1881. And just typical of the time period. But it, this was even ferocious by, the, by, by those stakes. And so that the survivors got together Every, you know, for years and years after, well into the 1930s. And so in around in the 1930s, somebody thought to put together a collection of their stories and 
memories of the storm. And that was extraordinarily helpful for me in describing the storm itself, the oddness of it, the electricity that was in the air, the, the graininess of the snow, how the winds were, how the temperatures plummeted. That was from their recollections. And so that was really, really helpful to me. Um, so so that, that was the research for this one. It was mainly reading those two books. Um, I did have, uh, at the end of the writing of the book, of many of my books, I have gone up into the mountains of Colorado near the end to finish writing. This is just something I do. It's my little own personal writer's retreat. And I generally go in October. So I went up to Estes Park, Colorado near uh, the week before Halloween. And I've done this many times. It has never snowed while I was there. The, the front range of the Rocky Mountains doesn't get snow that time of year. It gets it in the spring. But the week I was there, two back-to-back -back, back blizzards kept me inside my little condo. And I didn't starve to death. And I, you know, I wasn't having to go out in the snow. But um, that was certainly, it was a nice sign and a nice bit of inspiration for me. But I, you know, had lived, having lived in, Chicago for decades. I know cold and I know snow. So I didn't really have to imagine it too much, but that, that was mainly the research I did for this. <laughs> um, I We have um, taken so much of your time, but I, I before I open um, uh, this up to questions from our audience, I just wanted to ask you ladies, um, what else you might be working on right now. And I happen to know that Marie has the personal librarian coming out in June because it arrived in my office two days ago. And, <laughs> and she wrote that with Victoria Christopher Murray. Um, but if you all would like to share with us what you might be working on. Marie, would you like to start? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so the personal librarian, it was really um, just such a, an incredible writing experience for me. But um, it's about, you all are familiar with J.P. Morgan, the financier, turn of early, late, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, in the early 1900s, he built a library in New York City called the Pierpont Mar Morgan Library to house um, his collection of rare and priceless manuscripts and books. Um, he had lots of other collections, but this one was just for him, just for his things. And he hired a woman to run it, to be the curator, the librarian, his personal librarian. Her name was Belle DaCosta Green. Um, and she um, was, uh, during her lifetime, really became the most, one of the most powerful people in the art world, really shaped uh, the landscape, in particular with um, rare and ancient manuscripts, but she was only able to hold that role um, by hiding her identity. She was actually African American, but she was fair enough to pass as white. Um, and this is at a time period in, uh, just certainly during the four decades of her running the institution, um, when Jim Crow, the Jim Crow laws and segregation had become the law of the land, she would have never even been allowed inside the library, let alone run it. Um, and in order to do so, it was this, the sacrifice of passing was so much more poignant for her because um, her father was actually one of the fiercest advocates for equality um, in the years after the Civil War and the Reconstruction. He was the first African-American graduate of Harvard. He was the Dean of Howard Law School, and he worked alongside Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, people like that to fight for equality. So she really had, in order to succeed, you know, she was coming of age at a time period when um, some of those battles had been lost and the world was a, a really terrible place uh, for an Afri a young African-American woman. And so she had to, um, to pass as white. Um, and it's really a look at this incredible life, but also really a deep dive into I feel like a really important part of our country's history that often gets overlooked um, and one that's really important to understand how we are, where we are today. Um, and in fact, um, Victoria and I um, were rewriting um, or editing the book um, when Black Lives Matters really exploded across our country. And um, Victoria is an African-American woman. And, you know, it was really, we had been close and had been writing the book. But that moment just like sort of cracked something open wide and um, really the, the experience of looking at the world through her eyes 
um, and vice versa really change the book. Um, and we really hope that it opens up a lot of conversations about race and about the history behind race um, that maybe are a little bit different than, than what people have done before. So it's a really, uh, it's a, it was a really transformative experience for me. Wonderful. Can't wait to read it. I'm, oh, I'll be able to. It. I haven't seen many ARC, so I'm very <laughs> delighted that you've got one. Greer, what are you sure. working on? I am going in a bit of a different direction. Um, oh. Some of you have heard the story, but um, my next book is actually going to be the first in a series um, that is epic fantasy. So historical fiction is getting set aside for a little while. I don't expect to leave it forever. But um, if you like the strong women in my historical fiction, you are going to love the strong women in my epic fantasy. So it's set in a matriarchal world called the Five Queendoms. Um, and it's basically where women are the queens and the senators and the warriors and the magicians and, and everything else. Um, and then suddenly uh, girls in this entire world stop being born. Um, and everything is thrown into chaos, which is absolutely necessary for good epic fantasy. Um, oh, wow. So I really, um, some people have called it a feminist game of thrones, um, which is sort of a useful short, okay. not a great tagline. <laughs> um, I like that. If you like some things about epic fantasy, but you don't like uh, other things about epic fantasy, because um, it's one of those books that they say you should write the book that you want to read. Yeah. And when this idea occurred to me, I started hunting around for, for fantasy set in matriarchal worlds. And it's really surprising how little there is when in, in epic fantasy and, and it's a, you know, a, a genre where you can literally imagine anything. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because of the market and I think fantasy is opening up now in a way that it hadn't 10 years ago. Um, but luckily it's opened up in time for me to, to launch into this series. So 2022 is when the first book comes out. Wonderful. I can't wait to, hopefully I get yeah. you get Melanie, you've had a year with no, with nothing, with no and book. I've never done that. I haven't ever taken a year off. I needed it. <laughs> um, and it just depends on the day you ask me what I want to oh. write next. <laughs> there are two projects. <sighs> It, it, I, the, the one that right now claims my heart, but then there's another one that claims my head. And I think this business is one that you have to be pragmatic as well as write what you love. And, and sometimes the two things come together beautifully. And sometimes there's a bit of a struggle as to which is the right one to write next. So I'm in that place right now. Okay. I, I mean, I, I have them both ready to go. I've started down the path of both of them. Um, so I, I just, it's just, it's kind of still not ready quite yet to say. Okay. You gotta and wait for that tangible to come out at you. And just yeah, yeah. Question is, a will, when it comes out, will you tell us whether it was yes. the one that your head oh, called sure. you to do or your heart? No, certainly, even if I sit down to write now, um, which I hope to be doing soon, um, you know, it won't come out in 2022. It would be 2023. That's more of a schedule that I find that works better for me. I, I am not... Marie, I could not write as many books as fast as you do. I just can't do it. I think I write pretty fast, but I am no Marie Benedict. So. <laughs> Times I I wonder myself. How it's <laughs> You're younger than me, honey. You're way younger than me. <laughs> I'm not that young. I gotta I gotta keep it going while I can because at the other end of it, it's not gonna be pretty. <laughs> Marie, one of our attendees is a young fellow with the Morgan, and she's so happy to hear that you're telling the story of Belle de Costa Green. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. That made my day. Yeah. That's so exciting. Tell her thank you, please. Oh, sure. or thank well, you. She she can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Melanie, we have someone who says, Melanie, I bet you didn't enjoy the research for this book, meaning the children's blizzard, as much as the Mistress of the Ritz. Okay, the Mistress of the Ritz was the dream research experience to end all dream research experiences. It was, I convinced my husband we had to actually stay at the Ritz for a couple nights in order for me well to- Well done. <laughs> yeah, it, it was tax deductible. Never, ever in my life would I get that opportunity. <laughs> and I got, you know, so that was, 
I will never be able to, well, I won't say never, but I doubt that I'll be able to replicate that. So yes, for sure. Choosing to write about Nebraska in the middle of the blizzard in 1888 was a bit of a diff departure from that. And I don't want to say bad things about Nebraska or South Dakota. I love you. And in fact, South Dakota just chose the book for their one book, one South Dakota read for oh, this year. So love you, South Dakota. Love you, the Great Plains. It was a little different. I will, <laughs> I will say that. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, I love both books for different reasons. <laughs> and um, Melanie, um, I'm sorry, Marie, um, one of our attendees recently viewed the PBS coverage of Agatha Christie's Missing Days. And she said, it suggests that she would not have reached her level of fame without the disappearance. Do you agree? I have heard that. I mean, first of all, her, as I mentioned, her disappearance, you know, yielded media coverage that I don't know had really ever happened before. It was worldwide. It was literally a media circus in the town where she disappeared. Um, and she was um, a novelist on the rise when she disappeared. She just finished her book, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which you know, it's one of her most, I think, famous and probably one of her best novels, which is an unreliable narrator story, which played very heavily into the book itself, into the structure of the book itself. Um, I think it was her fifth or sixth novel. And she was making a name for herself, but she wasn't Agatha Christie, you know, like that we think of as Agatha Christie. Um, and there have been many, many theories around her disappearance. Um, some that, it, and during the time period, they thought it was a suicide. They thought her husband had uh, injured her or killed her. Um, they There have been suggestions that she was in some kind of crazy fugue state, that she had a concussion, all sorts of stuff. And one of the theories is that um, she staged the entire thing for publicity. I've heard that as well. Um, I, you know, I have my own fictional version of right, what happened. Right. Um, I don't believe that that really any of those things is actually the case. I think there's something entirely separate from all of that. Um, I definitely think that her disappearance in the media coverage led to her becoming more of a household name afterwards. I don't think that's the reason it happened. And in fact, she was horrified at the media coverage that happened. Um, the way in which her disappearance was scrutinized um, and picked apart um, really, I think, shaped her for the rest of her life. I think it was like a, an emotional scar for her. Um, and she became an intensely private person, a very re reclusive person, reserved, both uh, in public and private. So I don't think that that was the reason for it. I think that definitely might have helped some sales. I'm not going to lie about okay. that. <laughs> um, suddenly everyone knew her. Um, but certainly, um, uh, you know, the, the books that she wrote afterwards, she really wrote some of her best books in the years that followed. Um, her golden age really happened. And she was so incredibly prolific, both in terms of plays and she's like, she's like Greer poetry. I mean, you name it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that played a role, but I don't think that was the reason it happened. If that makes okay. sense. Okay. All right. Well, Kathleen, there's your answer for, for that. And Greer, did, what, do you think you'll be revisiting um, a legal arena after the Arctic Fury? Because half of your book is told from the court. Yeah, um, not in the near term, but I did love writing a murder trial. It was the first time that I got to write a murder trial. Um, and the research of figuring out how things were different, like the witness used to sit in like a box where they were basically just so separate from everything that it encouraged you to think they were guilty. Um, and of course there were no male judges, no male jury members. Um, and so just, just trials at that time, like the execution of justice then versus now, and it's certainly not perfect now. Um, it is a very interesting place to explore. Okay. And the last question is um, for Melanie, which character did you most bond with in, in the children's blizzard? Um, that's such a good question because uh, there are six different ones and they all some some of them surprised me so much and and again it depends on the day that you ask that my answer you know may may bounce around so today I'm going to say I would say Gerda who is the sister one of the two sisters who makes a decision 
the reason she makes this particular decision, I really empathized. She's a girl who's who wants more mm -hmm. and dares to dream a bit bigger than she comes to believe she should have been allowed to do. That in, in daring to dream bigger and then that impacts the decision she makes, she comes to believe she broke the contract between you know, the people of this community who weren't supposed to ask for more in their life. And again, I know these people, and I grew up in a situation very much like that with parents who uh, you weren't supposed to be ambitious, you weren't you know, you were supposed to work hard, but to ask for more, to dare to dream was not particularly um, uh, cherished or nurtured. And oh. that is the environment I grew up in. And I still dreamed big anyway. And I still had ambition and, and bigger dreams and wanted to get out. And um, and I encountered the resistance to that in the 19, you know, 80s. So a hundred years earlier, there was certainly, you know, a lot more. And this this young woman, I think, you know, I felt with I felt her. I understand. I understood her dreams and her wanting a little bit more than she comes to believe she should have asked for. So I would say Gerda. Yeah. That's a great answer. Okay. Ladies, thank you all for your generosity. This has been a wonderful evening. And um, I think that you've elicited an awful lot of interest in your books. Um, it was great. Thank you. Thank you.